What's happening everybody? Today, we are here in the Outer Banks at Ocean's East Bait and Tackle here in South Nags Head. And we're here with the Cobia man himself. <laughs> you guys, this is Captain Aaron Beetson, and he ah. is one of the top Cobia fishermen down here in the Outer Banks. And I call him the Cobia doctor, but he's the Cobia killer. And he's got his swag, which he's now selling online. So if you guys can't come down here and fish with him, then make sure you support them. A cobia fish is a lot of fun. It's very addicting. I may be the cobia killer, but I'll start right off by saying, let's be responsible and throw the big ones back. It's fun, it's cool. It's cool to put on the internet and everything, but in the big picture, it's a little more popular than it was before. So we would try to catch the 55, 65, 70 pound fish. We try to let them go to spawn for obvious reasons. But uh, get to catching these things, we're throwing yeah, a lot of jigs early season when they're hungry. We don't need to throw live baits because the water's not hot and they haven't started thinking about spawning. But on their way to the spawning grounds, they have to swim and eat. So guys, uh, for colors on cobias, uh, crabs, specifically calico crabs, are brown and orange. So it's not really too often you're gonna see a boat going cobia fishing without an orange jig on. Right. So I like orange and brown. Um, that little bit of brown right there can make a big difference, but but orange and white, orange and brown, those are my favorite colors for cobia, just because a lot of the cobia's diet is a calico crab that they eat on the bottom. So if you're throwing stuff that looks just like what they eat, might get a better chance, better reaction. Um, let me talk about heads real quick. This is called a football or a, a boxing glove. That's what that is. And that allows the bait to sink at a different rate as a, is something like this with a flat little section on it. So it's, it just sinks different at a different rate. It's pretty interesting. Stuff will do, do it like this when you're letting the jig sink before you hop it to them. Um, these heads are really cool, the squid head. It's much like a jerk jigger off the pier with a gotcha plug. You get this thing jerked one way, it goes this way, and then the next jerk, it goes this way. That's really tempting for a cubby to want to chase that down and want to eat that. But for as far as colors, guys, Chesapeake Bay, a chartreuse for whatever you or reason out there is a really good color. Mm -hmm. A chartreuse or white, um, mainly probably because it's a lot of bunker up there, a lot of menhaden that they're feeding on. So that yellow, green, white kind of color does really good up there. Some guys are get crazy about a pink. That's a bit of more of like a light pink, but like a hot pink really got they love those colors in the Chesapeake Bay as well. Um, not everyone's throwing jigs up there. A lot of guys are throwing live baits because it's gotten tricky on the bite and a lot of people are just more confident with a live eel than, than throwing these jigs. But I tell you, once you get comfortable and successful throwing jigs at Kobe's, you'll probably want to do a lot more of it. You want to talk about live baits and hooks? Yeah. So there's a lot of debate on a circle hook and a J hook. It depends on how many big fish you've pulled off on a circle hook. It can happen. You know, it gets in the corner of the mouth, you think there's a lot of pressure on it because he took a run, zzz, zzz, yeah. he turns around, boom, came out. Right. So the guys who have not done well um, keeping their fish on with circle, circle hooks, they've gone to J-hooks. Now, the mortality rate on cobias is, is not real high unless you start gut hooking them. That's why I use these. Right. I'm catching a lot of fish, so I don't want to hurt them. Yeah. I'm throwing them back a lot of times. We catch a big, big 90 pounder on a live bait. I'm throwing this hook so I can hook him. If he gets off, oh cool, we had a great fight. We weren't gonna keep that fish anyway. But if you're in a position like uh, you wanna really keep one and you're down to the last part of your day and you got a 30 pounder or a 40 pounder you're throwing to, I'd throw a J hook to him because when you finally do set up on him, that J hook's gonna penetrate different than a circle hook. It's gonna penetrate hard. Right. So if you have a fish in front of you, you plan on killing, I'd throw a J hook to them. If you have fish that you're just playing with or having a good time or just want to, I catch plenty of fish on these circle hooks, but people have pulled off a lot of big fish on circle hooks because of that. Yeah. But I prefer to do it because it's a, uh, it helps the fish out. Perfect. Are you always using that pound leader line? Uh, uh, pretty like much 50, for live 50, and 60, jigs. Okay. Yes, for jigs and live bait. Uh, okay. If I'm desperate for a fish late in the day, I got a client who's having a tough day and for whatever reason he hasn't caught what he wanted to, I might lighten my leader up. If I'm getting fish looking at me being weird and being leader shy or whatever reason not getting bit, I'll go down to 40 yeah. fluorocarbon with a smaller hook or whatever. Um, water temp? Uh, water temp, I've caught them as cool as 58 degrees. For real? I don't go fishing for them unless it's 64. Yeah. But the biggest fish I ever caught was 64 and a half degree water crazy 90 some pound fish and um didn't expect 
for it or its friends to be in that area. I was yeah. going south, obviously, to try to catch some yeah. warmer water and on my depth finder, but all of a sudden it got really rough and my client said, hey, this is too rough for my son and I. Do you mind taking us back in and catch some more of those big speckled trout we were on this morning? I said, sure. Went back into the beach, got out of the wind, and was going back towards Oregon Inland and what we call ran him over. I ran, I looked down and there she was. It looked like a hog swimming on top. It was huge. So anyway, long story short, they're in cool water. They can be in 60 degree water, 63, 64. They really like 67, 68, 69. Yeah. You're going to see Memorial Day weekend pop off on 68 yeah. degree water out and of Oregon Inlet. And that's when most people are going to target them, but they and like then, to come through. And they're spawning at that kind of like 72 maybe, or just... Yeah, they'll you know. spawn off a handful of times a year. I hear like Four, really? Yeah, like four, like up to, and now I, I sure get people uh, yeah. commenting on yeah. the exact time, but right, they spawn right. multiple times a year. Right. It's not just one big spawn. It's right. usually on a full moon. I've seen a lot of groups of fish here on the Outer Banks, Nags Head area, midsummer on a full moon, way up in shallow water. So I've seen over time that these big cubbies like to spawn shallow so their eggs can get dispersed in the waves. Mm -hmm. the only thing that makes sense to me, but big ones up shallow, 10, wow. eight foot of water. So same thing, uh, once spring hits, seems like the full, late the late full moon in April or right. early May kicks yeah. off the movement for cobias, whether, no matter what the temperature. They will come through because they are on a date. They have a mission and they're going north to spawn. And then I think just temperature and moon, it makes that happen. Do they spawn. return to their spawning ground? Absolutely. Uh, just like you and I go to work every morning, we typically have a gas station or a place we like to stop. Right. Cobias are very much the same way. So when you start targeting a specific area like Chesapeake Bay, Cape Charles, yeah. behind the fourth island, right. when you start targeting areas in the same time, you'll see uh, my, a good friend of mine does a lot of tagging for cobias and he'll see 100% recapture rate on all the cobias he's tagging in those areas. So it's proof that they come back wow. to where they're from. Um, now, it doesn't mean that every single fish is going to yes. come to that every single shoal, but like groups of fish tend to come back and just like some fish never enter that Chesapeake Bay, they go north. More than likely they were born up there in the Maryland somewhere, up Oceanside up that way, Jersey and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Chesapeake Bay guys uh, do a pretty good job of like keeping to themselves. I know there's been some issues in the past, but like best thing you could do if you see a group of boats, they may be on some fish, but that's not the only group of fish Dude, around. So thank you. take yourself off to the side, go, just go get lost somewhere and yep. you'll be really surprised what you find without getting in the way of someone else's own fish because everyone, once they find them, well, yeah, you did find them, I and you do kind of deserve to have that to yourself for a while. Just keep that in mind, guys, when you're in, especially that area, because it's just a confined area. And when you see a group of dudes doing their thing, if you know them, give them a call. Uh, just don't rush up on them. But yeah. again, get out there and get lost. Go somewhere yeah. you've never fished before, outside, yeah. inside, left, right, and go find a new area. You'll be surprised what you find. So back to that story of the big cobia that you caught when that he got sick, he wanted to come in. Do you think that you ran into that fish in some part because you were not around the crowd you were kind of oh, by absolutely yourself. oh absolutely so let's maybe talk just quick about like again just like the the anatomy of these cobia is there anything aaron that's like people might overlook about like you said i didn't even know that the the calico crab you said yeah that's a lot of their diet yeah and uh the bunker the the menhaden is a big part of their diet so cobias like to eat crabs typically early morning on the bottom you, I've never seen a cobia eat a blue crab on top in my I life. See, I see them swimming all the time in Chesapeake Bay. Yeah, so um, they do like to eat in the mornings on the bottom. That's why a lot of chummers like to yeah. chum for cobias in Chesapeake Bay. Right. Uh, but typically in the afternoon after they've done you know, their eat or whatever, they'll come up and they'll just kind of sun and surface and sun themselves, cruising around doing their thing like cobias do. Uh, I think that's their rest, actually coming to the top and just cruising like that. Now, obviously, they will eat because right. they're opportunistic fish yeah but yeah they love to eat they love to eat crabs they love to eat menhaden they'll eat mullet croakers yeah, yeah they like to eat, eat all kind of stuff bit of a garbage can their eyes huge so like how much do you put because like for me like red drum and speckled trout i understand those fish way better because it's like you can almost see their sensory and their snout you know the, the scent cobia i almost feel like the eyes are the big real big so being sight oriented, mm -hmm. but scent? Yeah, scent uh, has a lot to do. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll mess with scent 
when we're having a tough day to get him to eat jigs, we'll put some squid out the back or a piece of Berkeley galt tail, yeah, a little curly tail. Yeah. Um, a lot of days when we're having fish coming in, looking at our jigs, you know, we don't have any live baits because it's early season, coming looking at our jigs, and they won't commit. Mm -hmm. I'll grab some pro care. Yeah. Put it on my little plastic or put it right in the feather of my jig. And yeah, cobias, they have big old holes right in their nostril. I mean, they they have noses. Yeah. So they're very, and then again, when you talk about chumming for cobias, that's all that is, is putting yeah. out a good chum slick. When they smell what they want to smell, they're coming right up, up wind, up current, yeah. to come find you. So yeah, you can get a fish to, to commit a little bit better when you have some stink on it. Again, these fish are so heavily migratory. And I think you've told me, you know, there's been cobia that have been tagged in the Chesapeake Bay that have swam all around the tip of Florida? Oh, they've gone to Louisiana. My buddy had one tagged from Chesapeake Bay that ended up in Louisiana. And then... But not all are doing the same thing, correct. same patterns, but they intermingled, go crazy wild. And again, it's a temperature thing. Right. But some of them just have a wild hair and will go really far distances. Some will hang tight right off our coast in the, in the winter, southeast of us on a wreck somewhere. So not all of our cobias will go all the way south. Yeah. They do some different things, though. Well, some, do you think, maybe go like almost east to west? You know what I mean? They're moving offshore. Southeast. Okay. Yeah. Instead of going to Florida, right. some of our fish, I think, sit off our Georgia, South Carolina, North North Carolina coast, deeper off the wrecks. Got it. You know, 60, 62 degree water down there near the Gulf. Mm -hmm. they, they don't need to go much further. Such a cool fish. Such a cool fish. Yep. Yeah. Anything mm -hmm. else that just kind of... No, if you guys basic. want to do any bookings, I've got uh, most of May booked right now. I have a few openings, maybe six or seven days in May, and it's typically right around May 8th, May 10th. It goes bonkers. So... Even the first week of May could be really good. And there's a few openings there as well. And then we have some openings early June. So the first two weeks of June would be a good time to be down here and book a trip. I've yeah. got a few partners and a few friends that uh, if I'm booked myself, I can set you up with some other guys, get you rigged up with some quality captains that will put in the effort and fish all day. We do a six hour trip and we do a full day. So six hour trip, 750, a full day's 950. We can bring four people and we supply everything. Just bring some sandwiches, your cooler, food and drink, and we do the rest. Yeah, sweet. Well, there it is, y'all. That is the Cobia. I call him the Cobia doctor because he really is. He got his PhD in Cobia fishing. <laughs>